Hi, good to see you all. Welcome to uh, Find My Pass From Home. Um, today uh, is St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Donovan. Uh, I'm the Strategic Initiatives Manager at Find My Past, uh, and I look after the Irish Record Collection. Uh, and I'm here today with my good wife, Fiona Fitzsimons, who is one of Ireland's best known genealogists. Um, and uh, we're here to answer your questions. So thanks for tuning in. Hi guys, happy St. Patrick's Day. Excellent. Well, we've been uh, very ably helped out here by our colleagues in Fire Past uh, with questions that you've already asked about your Irish family history. And we're going to do our best to try and answer these. Um, so tell you what we do. I'm going to read out some questions here and we're both going to um, jump in and try and answer them as best we can. Because the first question we had from Ange was about her ancestry from County Cavan. She says, Mary Ellen Downey was born in County Cavan. And in 1884, she married Edward Parry in Liverpool. Uh, and uh, it states that her father was a John Downey, who was a policeman. She goes on to say that in 1939, register that she was born in 1862. The 1911 census says she was a widow. So you've done quite a lot of work, Ange, already. Uh, and then she died in 1941. So you're trying to find out her baptism, where she was from. Now, Mary Ellen was born in Cavan and her father was a policeman. That would indicate that her father was serving or well, came from a different county. He wasn't allowed to serve in the same county of his birth. So what you need to do is try and track down that John Downey, her father, uh, from the police records. And the RIC records, the Royal Irish Constabulary records, are on Find My Past. So if you go into the A to Z of records, where you search all records, and then plug in uh, Royal Irish Constabulary or RIC or police, you'll find the records there, and go and see if you can find out which John Downies were in service in the 1860s, and which of those uh, were serving in County Cavan. And that should hopefully get you started. Okay, next question. I'm going to put the question to Brian. He can answer this. Uh, next question comes from Mary. Mary writes, she has a James Fogarty that has several children. On some of the baptismal records, the mother is listed as Joanna Shea Fogarty. On other baptismal records, the mother is given now as Judith Shea Fogarty. Now, Mary asks, was, was James Fogarty moonlighting with two sisters, or are these one and the same person? What do you think, Brian? Well, um, I would have thought they were going to be the same person because, I mean, I know there's often alternate uh, names are being used, but Fiona quite rightly, and you should really be answering this one because you uh, said very sensibly that you should actually look at all the children's births and see whether one name is used for the first sequence of births and then the other name is used for the latter sequence of births because it is possible uh, that uh, uh, Joanna, for argument's sake, died and that the father of these children, James Fogarty, married her sister. That did take place. Widowers would very often marry their late wife's sister, and they might even have a second family with her. And the idea was it meant that there was childcare for the children of the first family, but also if there was land in the family, even a lease, it allowed the family to actually keep that land, to keep control of that land. So in a sense, it's a dynastic approach. Remember, in Ireland, the land hunger was such that even small tenant farmers might actually take a dynastic approach to marriage. Okay, then the next question, um, I can answer this one quickly uh, and we can move on. Uh, she, Deborah, she asked, my grandfather was in the Irish Merchant Navy. Is there a way to locate his service records? Well, there is. Deborah, on Final Pass, we digitize and index all of the Merchant Marine records for Ireland. Uh, and um, you'll be able to find them quite quickly through the A to Z of records. Um, our next question here, I'm going to put this question to um, to Fiona, uh, or do you want to read that yourself here? This is a question from Helen. The Ely family from Dublin were a Protestant family. The head was Richard Ely, 1808 to 1898, and the family were boot and shoemakers. I think they were originally from England. In his obituary, it's claimed that Richard was a cousin of Sir John Ely, KCV who fought at Waterloo and was governor of Galway. John Ely was of humble beginnings. His father was a proprietor of Furnival's Inn Coffee House in Holborn, London in the late 1700s. And she goes on to say that I've researched Sir John and his family and his mother came from Leeds. 
uh, and, uh, and, and so on. She says that I've also found an Ely DNA match in Colford, Gloucestershire, and I would love to learn more about the Ely family. Fiona, what can you do to help there? Well, I want to say hello to Helen, first of all. Helen's actually a former student of mine. She took the uh, class that I teach in Trinity College. Uh, I teach a two-year course in Irish family and social history. We're just coming to the end of term now. Um, I have looked at this question previously with Helen. We have looked at a range of records. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a paper trail for Helen's Eli, Ely family. I think at this point, the only thing that Helen can really do to try and push this forwards is to uh, start pursuing the genetic genealogy route. Helen, I would recommend that you take perhaps um, not only a test, but if you have a brother or a first cousin on the same line from which you descended from the Ely family, uh, try and get him to take a Y DNA test. Um, if there's more than one, if, if there's a group of you together, you might possibly uh, like to pool your money and get the uh, extended, the big Y DNA. Uh, but that can only be done if you have um, a male, a brother or a first cousin who's descended on that line. Um, the other thing I would strongly recommend is that you do not only uh, the ancestry, ancestry the test is fantastic, for the simple reason that it has the widest catchment area. So in a sense, you're spreading the net wide, more, most widely. But I also like living DNA and family tree DNA. Um, put your test results online. Make sure you link them to a GEDCOM. I was looking at someone's DNA and was asked to compare uh, results just in the last couple of days. The difficulty I had was that the people, although they were third cousins, they hadn't actually put up a tree to actually work out how and where the connection was. So make sure that your test results, your DNA test results, are linked to a good family tree, a GEDCON. Um, when you have your results from any one of these DNA tests, it's usually possible nowadays to download them and to upload them on other websites. I strongly recommend doing this. It means that you are casting as wide a net as possible. The family tree would also help you to reel in cousins of uh, So Helen, um, good luck with that research. Do keep in touch and let me know how you get on. Now, I'm going to read the next question. I'm going to ask Brian to answer it. This next one is coming in from Emma. Emma writes, I have two Irish families married. She thinks the names are not typically Irish surnames. She was wondering where they might have originated. And the names are Butler and Malone. She says, my DNA is 100% British and Irish, so guessing they're not far flung and an exotic place. Well, Brian, we looked at this earlier. And yeah. We were joking about the fact, how long do you have to actually live in Ireland before you're considered a native? And I say that as a fits fits the family arrived in Ireland between the 1180s and the 1220s. But some people have still at times referred to me as being a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Butlers would have been the same. And Butler and Malone, I have to say, are two of the most common surnames you'll find in Ireland. I mean, they're, they're up there with Smith and Murphy and, and, and the Donald and the rest of them. Um, Butler is a Norman name uh, and it's widespread throughout the country, best known and associated with County Kilkenny and Tipperary, but not just there. You'll find it in every county yeah. in the country. The Lobotler family would have arrived in the late 1170s. So they put down, they put down roots. They became one of the great magnet families in Ireland. Huge estates controlling entire territories. Um, the descendants of Butler are fairly widespread. Yeah, they're, um, they're found in huge numbers everywhere. It's extraordinary. Yeah. And Malone is not dissimilar. But Malone is a, of Irish origin, Gaelic origin. Uh, they come from the Midlands originally, but again, they seem to, they're far flung. They're, they're settled everywhere across the country, you'll find them. So, you know, you're, those are definitely Irish surnames. Um, um, so yes, you're absolutely right. They're, they're not exotic uh, at all. Um, 
Okay, next question. But Emma, start with what you know. Work back, look at the Butler and Malone, uh, try and track down to the first Irish immigrant who possibly settled in the UK, I presume, you're writing from. Um, if you can track down who is the Irish-born ancestor who settles in the UK, look for their civil marriage record in particular. That should give you the name of their fathers. Once we have that information, we can track, we can trace it back. The minimum information you need to trace anybody in Ireland in 19, the 19th century records is the individual's name, the name of their father, and their approximate year of birth. If you have those three pieces of information, it's usually possible to identify um, the townland, the parish, where they from. That's a good uh, lead into the next question, which I actually think is a, a question which will be relevant for a lot of people listening today. Uh, Margaret asks, what are the best methods for trying to track down where in Ireland your relatives are from and all the census records just say is Ireland? I mean, you come across this all the time. Where are you from? Ireland. Where were you born? Ireland. There's no location given. Um, so, you know, you've mentioned that the, the three things you have to have. What else would you suggest people should do? In that well, situation? the other things I would recommend is what we call a reverse genealogy. Um, there's often more evidence that survives for an immigrant ancestor in the host country, the country of settlement, than there is in the country they originated from. Um, look first of all to see where it is they settled. Is there evidence of chain migration? To give you a sense of that, there's a very strong connection between uh, County Mayo and parts of uh, Pennsylvania, for example. Uh, there's real chain migration from Ballina, County Mayo, to Scranton in Pennsylvania. So look to see who are the other Irish people living in the same community. Then you want to actually draw up a profile of the immigrant family in the country of settlement. You want to track things like marriage records, uh, state civil estate record, um, possibly a church record to see if you can get the father's, the name of the bride or groom's father. You might find it in the marriage license record, for example. I also like to look for things like um, the Civil War pensions. A friend of mine, historian Damien Shields, has done a lot of work on the Irish that fought in the US Civil War. And he, in discussion, has actually referred to the Civil War pension records as the last great untapped archive of the bad marriage. Um, so you could look at those, depending on the time that they settle in the US, you could possibly look at um, Civil War pensions. I also like to look at things like newspaper obituaries. Um, I like to look at the US census. There's an almost complete survival of the US census, with the exception of the 1890, of course. A good friend of mine, a fellow genealogist, Cromer McBride, says in her next life she wants to come back as a US citizen because the census records survive in such a complete form. Um, so do look to the census and see if it gives you any additional evidence. I was talking with an American lady just in the last 24 hours. We looked at the 1870 US census, which her cousin had previously seen, and there we had the Irish born parents and three sons born in New York and two in Illinois. We looked at the earlier census, the 1860 census, and a lovely piece of evidence sprang out of me. We suddenly saw that there is an earlier son, Richard, born 1853 in England. So that tells us that the couple married a good 10 years earlier than we had previously assumed, possibly married in England, and that the eldest child of the marriage was born in the UK. And of course, the surviving civil birth records from 1837 in the UK. So it's now possible for her to reach back to order that child's birth record, that hopefully will be the parent's marriage. So by comparing all the evidence that survives, including census records, it's often possible to get more leads that tell us, um, that give us more evidence about the family's origins. I also like to look at things like naturalization records. Uh, remember that people have to apply, they have to give notice in advance that they intended to apply for naturalization. Um, so look for all the different types of naturalization records that may survive in the US. Um, my key tip is always look for a 
gravestone and a newspaper obituary when an immigrant ancestor dies. Very often the last thing that an adult child can do for their immigrant parent is to give them a good Irish send-off, a wake and a funeral, and to alert the extended Irish American community to the fact that their parent had died um, with the idea of bringing everyone together for one last time. So you will often find really good evidence in records that are made in or around the time of death. Um, true, it's it's true in Britain as well, isn't it? You can, you, you, obituaries are still mm -hmm. hugely useful there. Yeah. Um, so I mean, for those of you who have Irish ancestry who moved into Britain, uh, again, you can have the same sorts of uh, principles can apply there. But basically, once you build up this profile of your immigrant family, you very often have much more evidence which you can then take back to the Irish records and hopefully you can reach right in and distinguish your ancestor from their doppelganger. And that's really important in Ireland when we get not lot of people who are very names. Same location, you're very true. Yeah. I've got another question for you, Fiona, which uh, you're far better placed to answer than I do. I should actually point out that Fiona is the expert genealogist in, in this uh, partnership. Uh, <laughs> um, and she works with the Irish Family History Centre here in Dublin and, and deals with complex family history all the time. Um, now, the question is, how do I get started when my Irish grandfather's birth in the 1930s was not civilly registered? Um, which is actually quite unusual, but uh, certainly it's a problem. Um, how would you deal with it, Kim? Okay, Stacy is the lady who sent in this question. Um, Stacy, that's a bit of a head-scratcher. My starting point would be to look and to search up to five years either side of the birth to be quite sure that the record hasn't actually been, um, that the record wasn't actually registered. It's a three-step process to register a civil birth. First of all, the parents or guardian present to the local registrar's office. They record the name. Then the local registrar makes a copy to be held locally and a second copy to be sent on to the SRD, the Superintendent Registrar's District, who likewise is supposed to make a second copy and send on a, send a copy to the, to the main index. Now, at each one of these three step, steps, you have room for human error. Very often a record has been registered, it just hasn't necessarily made it into the central index. And this is something we hope is going to be resolved with the digitization of these records, which is an ongoing project with the General Register Office. Um, so Stacey, start off by looking up to five years either side in case you have the wrong date of birth. And also look for all variant spellings of the name. If somebody went in, if they give the name, and the name is written down by a clerk, and if the clerk isn't from the district, they may simply record what they hear on their ear according to the, their internal phonetic alphabet, if that makes sense. So if you have a clerk from a different part of the country, they may hear Mathis said with a, with a, a strong lead accent and write it down as M-A-T-T-H-I-S rather than what a local would set it down as M-A-T-T-H-E-W-S. And there's a whole load of little, um, there's a whole load of little variables and quirks like that. The name Devereux in Wexford, for example, for example, is spelled as Deverux with the strong X, uh, and that's just that's just the local um, what would you call it? The local culture. And um, those are my first two things that it probably is registered, but possibly under a variant spelling or a slightly different date of birth. But Stacey, if you still can't find the if you still can't find a record, even when you take that, even when you just your search taking those two possibilities into account. What you might do then instead is to search for a baptismal record. Parents or guardians may not have been particularly concerned about registering a birth, but no parent or guardian will let a child go unbaptized. And because to do that, you are jeopardizing the child's soul. This is a part of folk tradition, but it's especially strong with Catholic families. So if you know the parish, write to the parish, to the sacristy, and ask whether or not there's a record 
the grandparents are doing. I'll read the next question and you can answer it. Okay. Uh, next question is coming in from Ramey. Ramey says, I've got a great granddad, Robert Clark, born 1866 in Ireland, dies 1906 in Glasgow, in Scotland. Robert's parents were Alexander Clark, a weaver, mother Eliza Welch. They married in 1859 in Castle Dawson. Now, Raymond can't find any other records for either of them. Um, no siblings for Robert. Can't even find a birth record. Knows they were still alive in 1889, um, at the time that Robert married. Um, they're on his marriage lines in Glasgow. And Raimi says, a nudge in the right direction would be great. Well, yeah, that's really interesting. I went off to go and have a look at this, uh, and I can see where you've got your information. You have the 1859 marriage, uh, which is recorded in the union of Mara Felt. Um, and it gives the details that both Alexander Clark and Eliza Welch uh, were both illiterate weavers. We know they're illiterate because they mark with an X, and they're both living in Castle Dawson. And they give, um, um, you know, and they were married in the local Church of Ireland church in the parish of Mahara Felt. Um, so that's that's quite useful information for a number of reasons. You said you weren't able to find any other records about them or about their children. So there is a way you can get around this because oftentimes the actual years of birth of their kids are not going to be what you think they're going to be based on what age they were when they died and so on because these records are not terribly precise, particularly death records. So what I did was to simply go through all of the children born in the union of Mahara Felt um, with the surname Clark uh, from 1864 when it starts. And by the time I, hit, I reached November 17th, 1866, I'd already found their first, or the first daughter that's recorded, Mary Ann. So if you want to go and find that, you can go and search on Find My Past and you'll get the index record. Or if you want to see the original, uh, you will have a chance to go and see the original record on irishgenealogy.ie uh, where they have uh, scanned images of these original records with an index which isn't actually quite as good to use to search as the one on Find My Past. So if you use the two together, the good thing about Irish genealogy is it is actually free. So, um, so what you can do, and it's a bit labour intensive, but it's not too crazy, it goes through every single Clark birth in the Union of Maharafelt from 1864 onwards, and you will find more. But you also bear in mind they're weavers, so they're mobile, and we know that they moved to, to, to Scotland. So what I would suggest you do is actually look to see what other births happened elsewhere in Ireland and Scotland, or even possibly England. They may have wanted to come through there. You just don't know. Don't assume anything because uh, they are a mobile family. Anyway, that's my, my tip for that particular one. We'll move on to the next one, and I'll ask you, uh, Fiona, because this is um, this is a complicated one. This is from um, Angel. I have two questions based on my done line. Was there a license or a register for coachmen? And she says that my great-grandfather was a coachman in Dublin in 1876. If so, where would I find it, please? Second, would there be a register for stewards of estates? My two times great grandfather was a steward near an Esworthy, Wexford. Um, so, if you know, what would you suggest for her? Angel, there's no register of coachmen in Dublin. Um, what you might do, if you think that your great great that your great grandfather owned his own livery stable, you could always search a commercial directory for Dublin and see if you find any record of him. Otherwise, there's simply no way to actually trace this, except through the catch-all records. Uh, what I will say is that if he's a coachman, he's probably going to be living in Dublin City Centre. I remember for one of the genealogy documentaries, we took a look at a similar kind of a family. And uh, we found that they were living in the city centre parish, St Mary's Pro Cathedral. Um, and all the family were living fairly close to one another. So that is a possible, I suppose, clue or some direction for how you might take your search. The second question was asking about a register of stewards. Again, there is no register, but if you know what the estate is the family are living on, you can trace the particular estate records. Um, the most complete collection of estate records is probably available on the National Library, nli.ie, and then search their sources database. I would also recommend you take a look at 
Wexford County Archives. You just Google Wexford County Archives. I know that they have records of some of the smaller estates, um, estate records where they have been handed over to the archivist or with the archives. Um, they're an excellent source. They'll very often take you back much earlier, before the start of city records, sometimes even before the start of church records in the district. Very true. And if I can, I can add one little bit of, of information to that question, uh, the biggest landowner in Ennis Dorothy are the Earls of Portsmouth, the Wallop family. Uh, and their estate records are in Hampshire County Record Office in England. Um, like many of the big landowners in Ireland, uh, their estate records can be found in local record offices across England. And Gil, this is one of the difficulties that estate records are very dispersed. There was never any attempt to try and gather in all records that pertained to one county. We also have the breakup of the large estates uh, under the Land Commission between 1891 and 1926, 13.5 million Irish acres are sold. They are sold on to tenant farmers. They're given the right to purchase their holdings. The difficulty with that is that some of these families that held the land, that they received the market price of the land, but they may subsequently have emigrated, settling in the UK, and taken their records with them out of the country. I'm very much of the opinion that estate records are part of our cultural heritage, even though estates would have been in private ownership. So as and when these estates break up, the records should actually remain in the country where the land was. And otherwise, we are taking sometimes the only record that can survive from the families who take those out of the country. Okay, next question. I'm going to put this one to you, Brian. Uh, Janet says, my great times three grandmother, Rebecca Corney, and um, she is in every census, uh, showing that she was born in or around 1808 in Ireland. She married here, I presume here is the UK, in 1927 would have been quite young, 18 or 19 years. She was widowed within four years, by 1831, and she never remarries. So, in other words, the marriage takes place before civil registration starts in Britain. Um, there's no father's name. And Janet asks, how can I find out more about Rebecca? Right, well, this is a tricky one, because you don't have very much information to work with. Uh, and I won't try and pretend it's going to be easy because it won't but there are some clues you can actually work with uh, if you have the marriage in 1827 what church did rebecca marry in? um what denomination is she that's quite significant because uh, that might actually help you narrow your focus of research in, in irish records catholic parish registers are digitized they're published online with an index on find my past mm. but presbyterian and church of ireland records aren't so if you know you're looking for somebody who's not of the Catholic community, then you may want to look at other records. But the English marriage record should also give the names of witnesses. You should do, yes. And that could be quite useful. You can find out your broader community that people are part of and relatives yeah. and so on. Witnesses are usually the closest friends or close family, close family members. Yeah. So it may allow you to actually wide match the net. You may find um, Rebecca had a sister. Um, it then gives you two names that you can actually search for. Very true. And, and of course, the, the name patterns of the kids, you may get lucky. She may have actually had two sons before her husband died. Well, yeah, the naming patterns in Ireland, I mean, they, they I wouldn't want to treat them as, as, a, as a, a rigid system, but naming patterns are remarkably um, strong. Typically, the first uh, boy that's born to a couple is named after the paternal grandfather, and the second boy is named after the maternal grandfather. So, therefore, uh, the mother's father's name, a forename, should should be the name given to the second boy that's born. Um, now, it doesn't always it's not always perfect that, but um, it's more often than not correct. Um, I don't know you've experienced you've seen quite a lot of these. Um, um, you can sometimes use the names that are given to the children as a rule of thumb if you don't actually have a record that gives you 
the name of the bride or groom's mm -hmm. and the father or the mother's own body. And, and do be aware as, as well that that a corny could be a, a it could be spelled in so many different ways. It could be <coughs> corny. It could be there's lots of different options there. So you need to keep very open minded about what it is you're looking for. Yeah. Um, um, but I think again, in a sense, what you're looking for, Janet, with your great times three grandmother is to do a reverse genealogy, to look for the records that survive pertaining to her and to her offspring in the UK, I presume, um, and to try and build up more of a picture of the family from that. Mm. The minimum information we need to identify somebody in 19th century Irish records is the name of the person born in Ireland, their approximate year of birth, even to plus or minus five years, and the name of their father. And if you can find a place, even better. Um, we always have an answer. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to be optimistic. Um, next question um, it's from Jared. My three times great grandfather, James Stewart, was born in the late 1700s. Don't know the date, don't know where, I don't know where he married and to whom. His son, Hugh, is another I don't know when, where born. Um, there's quite a bit here that's not known about. Um, I mean, I, I, my immediate response to that is that you should focus on Hugh uh, for the simple reason that you know more about him, but you still don't know enough. Um, yeah. Well, this is the thing with genealogy. Um, just if you want to look at it purely the method of how we research, we work from what we know into what we, towards what we don't know. So start from what you know, start with you. Look for a civil death record for you. You can, in his civil death record, if he dies after 1837, it should give his age at time of death. And you can use that to deduce his approximate year of birth. That would then give you um, a name, a year of birth, and the name of a father. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're looking to widen out the profile. What do you know for certain about your ancestral family? Um, work on that. So work on Brian, you're actually quite you're quite correct. Work with you. Look at that generation. Look for a marriage record, a civil death record, the names of any children born to Hugh and his wife. Um, Hugh's occupation, his occupation is very often around family, in families. In the last few months, I've looked at families that you had three generations of blacksmiths, or where you had three generations of musicians, fiddlers. Um, certain, yeah, I suppose certain occupations passed down within the families. And of course, famously, the US President's family, Joe Biden's family, were um, surveyors and engineers for two generations. The generation that brought the family to the US and the next two generations after some. Very good. Um, Alan, those, to those of you out there who don't know, uh, Fiona was the person who revealed uh, the presence of Irish ancestry. Now, our next question here uh, is from Ellen. Um, my third great grandparents, Martin Mahan, uh, and she insists that her grandmother insisted it was spelled M A H O N. She's absolutely right. It's exactly how it's spelled. It's not maybe pronounced M A H A N, but it's, it's spelled M A H O N. Anyway, her third great grandparents, Martin Mahan and Mary Higgins. She has no clue as to where they were born, married, and how they got to the USA, although we think they walked over from Windsor in Canada. Family lore has them returning to Ireland to fight in an uprising, dying there. I have no clue. Um, okay, that's a curious one. Mm -hmm. It's not until 1890 that they put in controls on the border between America and Canada and they begin to register people who are crossing over the border. So before 1890, people can literally just present themselves and walk across and take rest of they are in the United States. Um, okay, the question is, where can she trace more about them? This is a real curious one. Until recently, and when I say recently, I mean in the last 18 months, Irish historians would have told you that the rate of return of Irish immigrants was the lowest of all ethnic groups that settled in the US, um, at between 10 and 13%. Uh, 
and compare that to the rate of return of Italian immigrants, where almost half of all immigrants returned to the home country within 10 years. Now, recent work by the late David Fitzpatrick has revised the rate of Irish return. We're now looking potentially at something over and above 40%. And I have, yeah, it's amazing how a question can just be left for, I suppose, a long time, and a consensus comes up about what actually happened in the past. Um, and it's David Fitzpatrick, and more recently, I had in my inbox, I got an email just before I left the office yesterday evening, uh, a new article from Cormac O'Grother treating this exact subject. So this really is a hot topic at the moment. It is possible they returned. That's the first thing on. Um, start by looking at the list of transatlantic passengers, the ones traveling from the US between 1858 and 1870. So in the US past, yeah. to Ireland. Exactly. Um, that would capture anybody that may have returned home to take part in the Fenian Uprising in 1867. There are, of course, much more detailed records of Fenians in the National Archives, including one of the best small archives that I know of, the Fenian photographs. Mm -hmm. There's photographs of over 2,000 individuals taken 1866, 67, 68. I love photographs taken from this early time. Nowadays, we're all used to posing for the camera. In those days, it was still new. People are very unselfconscious. They're also very ungroomed. And you actually see simple things like um, somebody, I suppose, walking out with wildish, what we would consider quite wild hair, long or mutton chops. If you look at the photographs closely, you can see things like clothes, even of a well-dressed man um, who had a professional position, may be patched and mended over and over again. Because again, this is something which is very modern, that we're used to, um, we're used to much cheaper fashion. In the old days, you got a good suit of clothes and you kept on mending it until it was almost falling apart. And we see all of this in these female photographs. Fantastic. And one that I'm particularly fond of there is of a, a Union soldier in America who literally puts his uniform back on uh, and uh, arrives in Ireland with his gun. Right? He's, he's, uh, he's registered uh, uh, gun as part of the, the US Army and, and um, is arrested immediately as he walks into the country um, and photographed. Yeah, that's really true. An awful lot of men who had fought in the Civil War and who were Irish born they returned to Ireland for the Fenian Rebellion. They were taking the military training that they got during the Civil War, and they wanted to put it to good use in an Irish uprising. Uh, the Fenian Archive and the National Archive is very, very good. It's quite, really quite detailed. Um, and on the last online. thing, it's not online, so you will have to wait until the end of that thing. But on the last thing you might do is, if your ancestors died in Ireland, you can search for civil death record to try and pin them to a particular location. And then once you have that, you can begin to work it up, work the case up from there. Um, good luck. I'd love if you would get back to us and let us know what you find, because there is, what's that phrase? There's eating and drinking <laughs> that particular question. Mm. Uh, next question, I'm going to read it out. Um, Brian, can you answer? No problem. Nicole writes, she has a... Okay, Paulie, would like to know what part of Ireland her great times three grandfather came from. His name was Joshua Justin McKenna. He's born about 1795. He marries in 1819 in Salford, and he lived there for the rest of his life. And Pauline is writing in from Luxembourg today. Oh, good. Well, I mean, McKenna is, and Joshua Justin is an unusual foreman. Um, certainly, that's a, a clue, and it's... One of the great values of having an unusual forename is that it does make your research a little bit easier. Uh, I was able to find his death record almost immediately on Final Pass. He died in 1879, aged 88. But I'm pretty sure it's, it's the right guy because he's got the full name, Joshua Justin McKenna, and he's also in Salford. Um, what you need to do um, is trace his next step is to find him in the census records. Now, I had a look at the 1851 census. And there is somebody there which is probably right. He's a Joshua McKenna. Um, and he's listed as a, well, he's listed actually in the index as illegible, his occupation. But I had a look at the, um, 
the scanned image and it is he's listed as a booth and shoemaker um but whether that's the right person i mean he's in salford that will depend on what other corroborative evidence you actually have because you probably know the name of his wife or his children i don't because he didn't tell me um so um i'm not sure um but he marries an eliza or he's married to an eliza and i did find the marriage in 1818 in salford of a joshua mckenna to an eliza oldham um and that may be correct but you see without me knowing what you know i can't have that corroborative evidence to make sure I've got the right family. Um, so there's plenty you can do, but follow through from the 1851 census and work back from there. Again, it's like everything else, work from the records you know, then back to the next step. Don't try and jump over things because you'll end up missing something which will possibly be crucial later on. Um, and that's actually a good note to send out to everyone who's listening today. When you send in, in information to us, um, try and be as complete as possible. Mm -hmm. Concise, yes. But uh, as, as give us as many hard facts as you have to work from. The more information we have, the better traction we have. We're like a tractor. We can go out. <laughs> True. You're feeling I'll ask you the next one. This is from Nicole. And Nicole, you, you asked this question, I think you, you're twice. You're obviously eager to get an answer. So we're going to give you as much of an answer as you can. Now. Um, you write, I have a four times great grandparents named Francis Duffy, born 1807, and Margaret Alexander, born 1809, who came from Ireland and lived in Liverpool. How do I find out where in Ireland they came from? All I know is that their fathers, John Duffy and Robert Alexander, were farmers, and that's about it. I would love to know more about where in Ireland they came from, possible facts. Okay, Nicole, I assume you have their father's names if you have a copy of their UK marriage record. Um, it's an 1840 marriage in Liverpool, I think. Okay. Um, again, I think this is one that calls for a reverse genealogy. Uh, start by looking at the 1840 marriage in Liverpool, if you haven't already, to get the names of the bride and groom's father. Um, start working up develop a profile of the family to see what further information you can find out about them. For example, we found, we looked and we found a Duffy family in the 1841 census living on Maguire Street, and they're all aged about 30. Francis, Margaret, and Anne. Um, look to see in the marriage record, what church do they marry in? And then you can focus Irish research based on the church records. The Catholic parish records, all marriages for Catholics are published online and on my past, for example. So if you're a Catholic family, you should pick up, um, you should pick up uh, baptismal records for these. Um, if they're Church of Ireland or Presbyterian, you're not so lucky. These records aren't published online, it's going to take an awful lot more work to trace them. Um, at this time, land records are very incomplete. Now, I did have time just to make one quick, to take one quick look at records, the Tyler Plotman books. Tyler Plotman books are 1820s and 1830s, that kind of a time frame. Um, I searched and I found holdings in the name of Robert Alexander. Um, whoops. Yeah. Sorry, Robert Alexander in Taney Parish in Dublin in 1824. Another Robert Alexander in Bally Summerham in Sligo in the same year. And in Clonus and Monaghan, a Robert Alexander in 1832. Now, remember these records are not incomplete, but any one of the Alexanders could actually be the fifth, the great times five grandparents. In other words, Margaret Alexander's father. And those records are on the National Archives of Ireland's website for free. These are the type mm -hmm. of books. But I really think, Nicole, what you're going to have to do is, again, a reverse genealogy. Build up a profile of the family using the records in the UK to try and gather more information. Okay, I'll read the next question. Yeah, and you can answer it. <laughs> uh, next question is coming in from Jim. Jim writes, my great-great-grandfather, Hiram Calvert, 
was, we believe, born in Straban, County Tyrone, about 1820. He's in Griffith's valuation in the 1860s. There's a reference in the revision books to his home having been demolished. Now, Jim writes that he knows Hiram went to the US, as his granddaughter said he's buried in Pennsylvania. Jim would love to know where and when he was born and who his parents were and when he died. He's also looking for details of his marriage to Sarah McGettigan. He says he did find a Hiram Calvert in Pennsylvania who died from suicide, but I tragically in 1902. But he shows up on census in the US at the time that Jim's own great-great-grandfather was still in Griffith's valuation. So in other words, you can't have by location, so it can't be him. Um, and Jim would like to know how to trace Hiram Calvert. He says descendants are mainly in the US, but Jim's grandfather came to England, and he is writing in from Essex. This is an interesting one because um, you're right. Uh, there is a Hiram uh, Calvert who has a house on actually Barrack Street in Strabane, and that house is in ruins by 1860. It's not listed as being demolished, it's just listed as in ruins by 1860. So you do mention in your, your, your letter or your question whether they were involved in Strabane riots in 1869, but the house is already gone by 1860, so they've obviously left the country prior to that date. I also had a look at, at uh, our collection of pension applications. In 1907, they brought in a, a pension into Ireland. It was pretty paltry, but you know, it's an awful lot better than nothing. Uh, but you had to prove you were 70 to get uh, the pension. So applications came in for people to do a search of the 1851 census to prove they are 70 because Irish civil registration starts so late in 1864. Uh, and there is an application which was submitted in around 1910 by Mary Calvert, who says she was born in 1849 and reports her parents' names as Hiram Calvert and Sarah McGettigan. If you can you've got them, yeah, they're there. And she says that they lived in a street in Strabane in 1851. Perfect, this is exactly what we were looking for. But there's no transcript given of the 1851 census, which is an enormous shame because usually there is. But there, there is evidence to believe that in fact this information is correct. So. Uh, you've now got a really strong basis in which to work from um, the, uh, the, the family by using working backwards from Griffith and now it's looking to go and see if you can find parish records for exactly that area. Again, you're going to want to try and find out what denomination the family are um, and hopefully you'll be able to get some further. I don't know, you yeah. might have some further things you can mention if you want. No, I was just going to say, Jim, you've actually got a bullseye. Brian has got a bullseye for you. Um, confirming that the family lived in Strabane at this time. I think what you should actually do now is to, if you know what faith community your family belonged to, switch your research to look at local church records. Look at the PRONI Guide to Church Records. Just Google Church Records PRONI, P-R-O-N-I, and um, then look to see what records survive and where they're held for Strabane. Um, and focus your research there. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Catholic records are online at Family Cards. But I do think you're going to find an awful lot of material there. And again, we'd love to hear back from you, Jim. Okay, okay I'll read out the next one if you don't mind, Fiona. You can ask me. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Marge. Um, I'd love to know how my ancestors came to be in Balilinta until some of them came to Australia in 1853-54. I know the Mitchells came from Ayrshire, that's mm -hmm. in Scotland originally. But Robert Mitchell was a linen factor, an overseer, until 1835. More I can't find out. I'm from Adelaide, South Australia. Okay, Mark, I started off by clearly identifying where was Bally Linta Townland. I looked at loganum.ie, um, L O G A I N M.ie, but you can also use townlands.ie to try and pin down place names in Ireland. Both of them are free websites. I found two Ballylinta townlands, one in Derry and the other in County Down. Now, this is basically the heart of linen country in the northeast. From the 1820s onwards, the local cottage industry of linen manufacturing was gradually mechanized over the next 60 years. And a lot of weaving, which would previously have taken place in people's own homes, 
was now brought into the factories. The industrialists that financed these factories, they often brought over skilled machinists from Scotland and from Northeast England to train factory workers in how to use them. So depending on which Ballyventa your family lived in, it's very probable that what you should, where you should actually focus your research is looking at textile factories in that particular part of the country. Um, records of factories in Derry, a huge number of those are actually held in the Derry Museum and Archives. PRONI in Belfast has over records for over 250 textile manufacturers from the 1820s to the mid 19th century. So there's a very strong probability mark that you will find further evidence of your ancestor who was brought across from Asia to work in the early linen manufacturing in, uh, in Ireland. Okay, I'll leave the next question for you, Brian. <laughs> this is Liz. Liz is looking for records to help with the birth of her great-great-grandfather, Robert Graydon. She says he died in the fourth quarter of 1906 in Wigton, England, 1877. He first turns up in Liverpool in the 1851 census. She says the census records are very showing that he was either born in Ireland or in Wicklow, the Garden of Ireland, and um, would have been born about 1830. His marriage certificate shows that his father was also Robert and deceased by the time that he married. He was a land agent on one certificate. Um, Liz is looking for suggestions for places she could search or for any methods on how she might develop her search. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I think we were both having a look at this earlier on. Um, we, we didn't find Robert Graydon on the 1851 census, so I went hunting around there and had had no luck at all. Um, but that's because I was looking at the wrong one. It was actually in the 1871 census, which mm -hmm. is, is an easy mistake to make. So, But um, he's there, and in fact, it, it's the same information he said. He's from Wicklow in Ireland, which is fantastic. I would have thought it would be easy to find the Graydons from Wicklow in Ireland, but it's not that easy. This is not an unusual, it's a very unusual surname. Um, he is, however, a nursery. Yeah, well, that's he's it. A gardener. He's a gardener. That's actually really useful. Uh, and he's with his wife, who's actually older than him by quite a lot. She's 57 at the time, he's 41. And um, that's interesting as well. Um, they're a resident of Warrington Road, Rainhill, Prescott, Lancashire. Um, presumably, the children were born much earlier, or his descendants were from a second marriage. So, tracing the UK marriage record for, for either marriage, they would still have Robert's father's name and occupation. Uh, if he was still alive at the time they married. Uh, and basically use that evidence to work up the case. It's, it's much like Fiona's been saying over and over again. We, if you've got to build up a profile of the person you're looking for, everything you know about them, to have good success in Irish records, the more you do before you start approaching Irish records, the better. Um, in a sense, this is reverse genealogy again. Mm -hmm. Use the evidence in the host country, the country that uh, Robert Graydon settled in, to try and find more evidence that will allow you to reach back into the Irish records. Uh, with a name like Graydon, one thing I would say is to check and see what church did he marry in? Does he marry in a Catholic church? Or does he marry in the Church of Ireland? There's quite a sizable Church of Ireland community in Wicklow. And I suspect names can be cultural signifiers. I suspect with a name like Robert Graydon, that he may actually be Church of Ireland. That would be the, you know, the assumption, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm going to read this next question for you, Brian. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, Francis Rocks, was supposed to have remarried very quickly after the death of his first wife, Annie O'Hara Rocks. Um, this is sent in from Angela. Angela can't find either Annie O'Hara Rocks' death or Francis Rocks' remarriage in Tyrone in the 1890s. And she asks, any suggestions? Well, yeah, that's a tough one. I, I went looking myself to see what I could find more, and it's very, very difficult. Um, what we need to do is we need to find out about Annie Rocks, of where she died and when she died. Um, and, and really, it, you need to actually try and track down the location. I think there's probably a good chance you'll know uh, whereabouts they were. You say it's in Tyrone, you get a more precise location. Because um, uh, without knowing uh, the parish where she lived, uh, it's difficult to actually get uh, specifics, but th th she's not showing up easily, and neither is, is uh, marriages with Francis Rock, so that I can easily pinpoint this case. So I think this is another example of where you need to do further research 
in the host country to actually try and unlock details to allow you to actually get uh, what you're going to need to find in the Irish records. Okay. The next question we have is more of a generic question. Um, this is, I live in, sorry, from Karen. She says, I live in Australia and would like to know what records are available on the website, Five Months Past, uh, for Kings County, awfully. Uh, Kings County was the, uh, the name given to uh, what is now County Offaly from the point that it was established in the 1550s right through to, to independence. Um, but it was renamed Offaly after independence. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, it's like everything else in Five Past. If you go to the A to Z of records, when you're searching all records, you have a, an option there to search all records. You'll, you'll bring up the A to Z of records, and you can actually pop in the county name there, and everything that we have relating to the county will show up. That's the easiest answer. I mean, do you have anything more specific you'd like to add to that? No, I mean, there's very few records which are specifically for Offaly. Possibly, um, and by that I mean you might have local government records, which are exclusively Kings County, Offaly. But otherwise, what you're really looking at are catch-all records, like civil records, Catholic parish registers, petty sessions registers. There may be ones which are specific to Offaly, but in a sense, these are records which extend to the entire island, north, south, east, west, every single point. Um, what do you, do you read you a specific question here? We've got one, you've been doing some work on this one. It's from Lynn. My great-great-grandfather was Lawrence Collins, born in Ireland in 1847. He married Mary Larkin. She was born in 1849, I think in County Armagh. Unsure of the area, great-great-grandfather was born. They married in Dumfries in Scotland. I have details on Mary's parents, uh, Neil Cornelius and Bridget, I think. Looking for details on Lawrence's parents. I think they were Peter and Bridget, Nay Boyle. Uh, they never, as far as I can see, came to Scotland. And it's with them my trail stops. Can you give me tips on how I can find out more about Lawrence and his parents? And she said it'd be greatly appreciated. Lynn, if, if Lawrence's parents were still alive at the time that he married, then it's very probable that we can trace them further. Um, so I would start by looking at the Scottish marriage record. Look to see if there's any evidence that the parents had, were dead at the time that their son marries. Uh, confirm the names, including if possible the mother's maiden name. Uh, look to see what church it was they were buried in. Uh, Catholic parish registers are published online and find my past with an excellent index. So you could try searching to look for a baptismal record, for example, of Lawrence Collins, or for any other children born to these same parents. Sometimes an indexer may have overlooked the baptism of one child, so but if you know the parents' names, including the mother's maiden name, you could look in this case for uh, Peter Collins and Bridget Boyle, for example, and look to see any other any children baptized to this couple. Um, I think land records are going to actually give you what you are searching for. If you can find Peter still alive in Griffith's valuation, then you can work from that point. Council books, the valuation of his council books are published online on the PRO NI website. So what you might do is uh, look at the council books, which would be the manuscript revisions, updates made after the date of publication. Um, look to see how long Peter Collins may have continued at them. When you see him struck out, that's probably the time in or around when he died. You can then search if it's after 1864 for a corresponding civil death record. And the evidence of the council book and the civil death record taken together corroborate one another. I would hope to see his wife, uh, who you think is Bridget Boyle Collins, stepping into the family holding. And I would love to see how long she continues. And again, you can use the evidence of the council books to trace this forward. The valuation office records are, in a sense, they're the spine of all family history research. And you can trace families from 1830 right the way through to the 1980s. So even after families leave, if anyone in the family remains behind, it's usually possible to see them in these records. Let's squeeze in one last record from June. Uh, June has written 
how do I find out about employment in Ireland before the 19th century? Oh, okay, Jim. Well, I mean, um, there is an excellent book uh, which you, you you make reference to quite a lot here. You know it far better than I do as well. Um, well, that's Katrina Tears, Social Change in Everyday Life in Ireland. I use it almost as a textbook for the class that I teach in Trinity. But the time frame of that book is 1850 to 1922. Employment in Ireland before the 19th century. A great number of people would have been employed in agriculture. So the kind of records we can look for then are land records. I think we're looking at over 50% of the Irish population employed on the land in some capacity at that time. Ireland never experienced the kind of industrialization as happened in the rest of the UK, which we were part in Scotland. Um, where might you look? There's a lot of occupational records in time and past. I mean, you should always start with what's the low hanging fruit, stuff that's easy to find, mm -hmm. and go and see what's there. Um, but you need to you need to research and find out what specific uh, area of employment, what sector of, of industry or, or commerce or otherwise you're interested in tracing, and because that'll actually lead you down to specifics. And again, the, the sources catalogue at the National Library of Ireland website is very useful in identifying what records exist for that particular occupation. There's a lot of big infrastructural projects that take place in Ireland in the 18th and early 19th century. And I'm thinking now of new roads, straightening roads, building of piers in the early 19th century, the development of the railroads, the development of the canals from the 1720s through to the 1790s. And there are records of employment, people who actually worked on those infrastructural projects. The difficulty is that very few of those records have been digitized. Mm -hmm. um, they're only available in manuscript. So you have to know exactly what kind of trade or occupation or profession are you looking for. When you're looking for people who are trained in professions, the records are they're much yes, better. Definitely. People are much more visible because if you're in the professions, Chances are you've got a university education and you're educated in the Inns of Courts or possibly one of the vocational colleges, like the Royal College of Physicians, established in 1654, the Royal College of Surgeons, established 1784 to train surgeons for the Royal Navy. Um, the records of those institutions are more widely available. They're published online, sometimes by the institution itself. Um, so, June, this is a little bit of a how long is a piece of string kind of a question. We need to have a little bit more direction, uh, otherwise, we're going to end up giving you an essay kind of an answer. Yeah. I think we've gone over time as well. I had hoped that we'd actually be able to go through some of the questions in the comments that have been coming in during the course of this, but uh, we're, we're, we're probably a bit over time at this stage now. I'm not sure if we, we can continue going for much longer. What we might do is just say hello to some of the people who joined us online. Uh, hello to Keith Smith, um, has a great-great-grandfather on the 1841 census born in Ireland. Has the marriage in Sheffield in 1823, but apart from that, nothing. How can he start to trace his origins in Ireland? Uh, Keith, reverse genealogy. Start by building up a profile of the immigrant family in the host country. In this case, Blighty. Start by looking to see what further evidence you can find for the family that settled. So, from your great great grandfather, who did he marry? What are the names of his children? Remember the traditional naming pattern in Irish families. Uh, what's his occupation or status? Uh, let's see, who else is here? Hello to Carol Dixon joining us from Northumberland and to Christine Hodson. We asked about railway workers. Okay, railway workers' records are mostly not online, but there is a railway records is a historical society, actually mm -hmm. not very far from where we live, but it's down in Euston Station uh, here in Dublin. And it's worthwhile contacting them, they might be able to help you. Now, currently in Ireland, everything is closed with lockdown. Yes. What you might do after lockdown lifts, lifts is to write a letter to the Railway Historical Society. Their archive is open one evening a week. So if you are traveling across from the UK, Christine, you're going to have to be very careful about how you plan that. Um, but they are very helpful. They couldn't be more helpful. But a word of warning, 
most of the records that survive only start from the 1890s and the first two decades of the 20th century. Even though we had railroads from the 1830s in Ireland, we don't tend to have a great survival of railway workers' records before the 20th century. Onion Tomas is listening to Irish music. She might just do some Irish family history work in a bit. Uh, she just got to a juicy bit in the Scottish Kirk records on Scotland's people. Onya, I'd love to hear more about uh, juicy Kirk records. Um, hello to Andrea Cruz. She's joining us from Nova Scotia. Wow. Happy St. Patrick's Day, Andrea. Now we've got uh, Anne Robertson. Uh, my great, uh, great, great grandparents appear in the Glasgow Porlo application that gives their in, uh, North Places, um, Bahola County Mayo. But I can't find anything tying them to Mayo. My husband's great great grandparents in uh, Porlo in Glasgow gives their birthplace as Baholo. Can't find them either. Now, my question is should I assume the person registering them in Glasgow only knew the Baholo area? Well, you never know. <laughs> um, can I jump in and answer this? I think that you have two separate pieces of evidence, both of which identify Baholo in County Mayo. Um, the Poor Law Union would have wanted to know what Poor Law Union they came from. A Poor Law can cut across county boundaries. Um, where can you find a map of Poor Law Unions? Well, you can actually look at the, the registration districts, uh, which are on mm. the Pass website, because of the same structure as the Poor Law Unions. Uh, so you'll find that if you look at uh, birth, marriage, death records, you, you'll, you'll see a link in the um, further information. Um, or actually, you can, you'll find a, a link uh, on the help guide um, mm -hmm. as well. I can't remember exactly where the link is, but we can put most up here. But Anne, I would take uh, I would take that as really good, firm evidence that the family are from Bahola. But Bahola, the poor law union, and if, like I say, a poor law union may actually cross county mm -hmm. boundaries. So look to a map, try and see what's the catchment area, but you can focus with confidence, you can focus your research within that PLU. Okay, Or H. Russell says, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Well, Or H. right back at you. Or H. is just starting their Irish research and wondering the best place to look for records dating from the first half of the 1800s for Bally Grady in County Cork. Believes there was a church or graveyard there at one time, but there's no village left at all now. Well, I mean, I think the thing to do is actually look at the, the records we have for the entire country, because certainly with the Catholic records, and we've actually got a fairly sizable collection of Church of Ireland records for, for, for Munster as well and for Cork. It's well worth looking at those and see what what's you're going to find there first. We've got Ruby um, Hardy McCauley says hi from Paisley. Diane Mullen uh, asks, is there a way to find my granddad's Irish Army records? He's from Stravan. I'd start by looking at the 1922 army census and that is published online on the military history archives and this again is another free website so just google military history archives and you should be able to find your way very quickly to the 1922 census okay hello to kathy libby small she is joining us from southern illinois and to paula zirkless my old my old mucker i suppose Happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you, she says, Oscar Elder. Uh, Sharon O'Brien, happy St. Pat's Day from the O'Briens to everyone who has joined us online. And Ruby Hardy McCauley joins in, up oh, please. Um, Ruby Hardy McCauley, okay, sorry, from Paisley. Uh, Cheryl O'Brien, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Sorry, okay. And Sue Moon Warner, uh, she is late, work got in the way, she says, and happy St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Day. Uh, we have Audrey Dempsey. Uh, says happy St. Patrick's Day. My uh, three times grandfather John Donovan married an Esther Doyle in the 1850s. Any relation? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I need to know about place and, and uh, contacts there to work that one out. Audrey, there's certain parts of Ireland where if you throw a stone, you hit a Donovan. So pick the West Cork, <laughs> I can tell you. And there's other parts of Ireland where if you throw a second stone, you're going to hit a Doyle. Uh, yeah, we really need something a little bit more focused. But I think it doesn't ring any bells immediately, anyhow. Um, Sue Moon Warner and Onya Nitmos are both online. There's Catherine Roddy. Uh, asked my grandfather's family lived in the same house in Maharafelt for five generations. I have the address. Where can I write to you for records? Also, is there a list or something somewhere in Northern Ireland of Presbyterian ministers? Well, if there is to extent, yes. There is a Fasti Ecclesiae of Presbyterian ministers in three volumes published by the Presbyterian Historical Society. 
if you go online, uh, just Google Presbyterian Historical Society, and I think you can actually buy that work or the three volumes online. Um, and it's quite a modest price as well. It's true. And also, if the Presbyterian Historical Society is the archive for that place, mm -hmm. so it's worthwhile having a look at their website to see what they have. I see some of my regulars from the uh, Facebook Live, the Genealogy Live at Five online. Hello to Anna Paluzzi Moran joining us from Lakeland, in Florida. Anna, I always joke, is my Italian Irish connection from Florida. Yes, yeah, Liz Whitty from a different place, but Liz Whitty is from Cork when I last looked. Liz is one of my <laughs> Trinity class. Liz, great to see you online. And we have a happy St. Patrick's Day from Barbara Malcolmson Bailey. Um, wants to know, could you tell me where to look to find birth certificates for children born probably in the city of Cork between 1814 and 1820? They are half-brothers of Lady Kane, Catherine Sophia Bailey, by her father's second wife. I found the youngest uh, boy's birth certificate in the National Library of Ireland, Ireland Roman Catholic Parish Baptism, St. Mary's, Cork City, Diocese of Cork and Roth, but can't find the others. Well, that's going to be a tricky one because we are before civil registration, so it's going to be about survival of individual sets of parish records. And that is right the time frame where things start um, at the best. Yeah, Barbara, I do think the best Catholic records for Cork are available on irishgenealogy.ie. Um, that website is particularly good for Catholic records of Cork City and Dublin City. Mm -hmm. um, both of them, they would have been two of the largest cities on the island at the time. You can get lost in some of the other online collections, but those ones on the Irish Genealogy.ie website are very comprehensive. Uh, you could also take a second bite of the cherry by looking at Genealogical Office registered pedigrees. Um, if you Google Virginia Wade McCandless, or if you go online on the NLI.ie and look for what is available on the Genealogy Office for the family. Um, hello to Teresa Doherty Waters joining us for St. Patrick's Day, and she sends out greetings to everyone. Shez Gordon, another one of my Friday regulars, is in South Carolina. She's going to watch Darby O'Gill and the Little People. <laughs> and She's also going to look after the corned beef cooking for dinner tonight. <laughs> that sounds delicious. That's fantastic. We've got Andy McCartan, who says hello from, from Belgium. Uh, Sue Warner is uh, saying hello to Anya and Tomas. These are part of my Friday regular crowd. As, as um, Marion Allen answered the question about the Royal Record Society, so that address is there for that previous uh, writer. Marion is one of my more enthusiastic students from the Trinity College class. Uh, Marion is an enthusiastic genealogist and also part of the Clare Roots Society, one of the most active genealogical societies in Ireland. Uh, hello to Christine Hodson. She says, I assume that you is a very Irish name. It certainly is, Christine, uh, and particularly common in the Mayo area. Uh, hello to Anita Marie, her third great, her great, great, great grandfather is from County Cavan. Andrew Farrelly, it's such a cavern name, and Rose Rochford. She says, what can you tell me about the surname Rochford? It seems very rare in Irish records. Not so rare in Wexford. Uh, Rochford and Rochford are, are relatively common in, in parts of Wexford and actually parts of Cork as well. Yeah, Rochford is also a landed family in County Mead. I'd actually expect to see the Rochfords in Dublin or Mead more than anywhere else. And of course, Mead, West Mead, so you're close enough to County Cavan. Um, Ruby Hardy McGauley says her granny's maiden name was Scanlon. Any idea where in Ireland she came from? Uh, Ruby Scanlon, I would almost put money on the fact she's either from Clare, Limerick, or Kerry. Uh, my own grandmother, uh, her maiden name was Scanlon. And when I looked in this last year, I took a much closer look. I had more time. I took a closer look at the Scanlon family history. And I found an absolute concentration of the records in those two counties. Um, originally from County Kerry, crossing into County Clare in the 1600s, and by the early 20th century, have spread uh, west into County Limerick as well. And Oliver Jacques uh, writes, my, my ancestor was born in 1911 on St. Patrick's Day in the Lear, and she <laughs> left approximately 1930 for England. What other than census records are there to help me find any record of her existence? Um, well, 
we will hopefully um yeah you, there, there is it is gets more difficult the more modern a time frame you get um it should be possible to get a civil birth record in 1911 on irishgenealogy.ie and you should also find evidence of the family in the 1911 census you'll find that on find my past Um, and to trace them back. I think we're being told we need to wrap up now. So there's an awful lot of other questions and comments and, and good well wishes and a happy St. Patrick's Day is in here. But I think we're just going to have to wish you all a very uh, happy St. Patrick's Day uh, and also remind you that the, the next face, uh, the next session that we're running here on Fire Pass is on Friday, where you'll be able to join Miko for our Friday live session. Um, so thank you all very, very much. And thank you, Fiona, as well, for coming along and bringing your expertise to, to this session. It's been fantastic for sure, St. Patrick's Day. What else? Day. <laughs> <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Listen, cheerio. Good Thank you me. very much. And Ellie, thank you so much. Thank you, Ellie, for actually facilitating us. It's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> okay, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone.